going to talk about the weak gravity conjecture from unitarity. All right. So uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure coming to Madrid, especially to this very exciting and timely workshop. And in this talk, I will be mostly talking about an upcoming paper with uh, Yuta Hamada and Toshifumi Nomi. Both of them are in the audience. Uh, we will show that in a wide class of theories, the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture follows from very basic principles such as uni unitarity. And I will also mention an earlier work in which we apply the unitarity constraints in somewhat different ways to argue for stronger versions of the weak gravity conjecture. Now, before I tell you about this work, let me say a few words about the Swarmland program. It's often said by the critics that uh, the Swarmland conjectures are a bunch of wild speculations. This is far from the truth. What we have is an intricate, intricate web of proposed consistency conditions for quantum gravity. Now, the reason why we have so many conjectures is that uh, the rules for quantum gravity are not yet fully understood, and that makes the subject very exciting. Of course, we would expect that as, you, as we understand the principles behind better, the number of conjectures would reduce. Already, we can see that some of these conjectures are related in a rather direct way. Uh, we can think of the weak gravity conjecture as an upgrade of the conjecture that there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity. Uh, since, gauge, since global symmetries can be thought of as gauge symmetries with vanishing gauge coupling, uh, it's natural to suspect that something goes wrong when the coupling is weak. And if you refine the weak gravity conjecture to a strict inequality, we are led to the ADS instability conjecture. And consistencies among, uh, consistencies appoint collusive Klein reduction suggests stronger versions of the weak gravity conjecture, such as the tower weak gravity conjecture or the sublattice weak gravity conjecture that requires an infinite, that requires infinitely many charged states. And there are also conjectures that seem naively unrelated, like the distance conjecture and the De Sitter swarmland conjectures that were revealed this morning. Um, the swarmland distance conjecture uh, states that for any consistent theory of quantum gravity, there must be a maximum field range beyond which a given EFT breaks down. And so the reason is there's a tower of light states that becomes exponentially light, and that invalidates the effective field theory that we start with. And interestingly, as it turns out, the tower weak gravity conjecture and the sublattice weak gravity conjecture can be thought of as special cases of the distance conjecture. As we send the gauge coupling to zero, which takes us to infinite distance in field space, uh, the tower of states that are required by the weak gravity conjecture indeed becomes light. And as Aaron explained very nicely this morning, uh, the De Sitter conjecture can be shown to be related to the Swarmland distance conjecture through entropy considerations at weak couplings. So as you can see, what quantum gravity has given us is uh, quantum gravity has put us in a very strict jacket. If all these conjectures were random speculations, they would not have to fit into this very intricate web. And this also gives us confidence that perhaps if we can understand very well, or perhaps prove one of these conjectures, we may be able to find out what is the underlying reasons uh, that unifies the different statements about quantum gravity. So in this talk, I will focus on the weak gravity conjecture, which is arguably the most well-studied one in this web. And just to remind you, uh, the weak gravity conjecture states that for any U1 gauge theory that emits a UV completion with gravity, there must exist a state whose charge to mass ratio is bigger than that of an extremely black hole. And this is sometimes known as the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, this conjecture, which implies that an extremal black hole can decay, is well supported by many examples in string theory. Now, a heuristic argument to motivate this conjecture is to consider theories that violate it, uh, which means that all the particles in the theory have a charge um, smaller than its mass. If this is the case, then the gravitational attraction between these particles is stronger than the gauge repulsion, so they can form bound states. Now, these bound states cannot lose their charge and do not Hawking radiate once they reach the extremal limit. We therefore end up having an infinite number of stable states. So what the weak gravity conjecture really does is to postulate that there should not be a large number of exactly stable states that are not protected by asymmetry. And this is exactly how it was stated in the original paper. Um, 
Now, to avoid the situations from happening, we can uh, demand the existence of a state whose charge to mass ratio is bigger than one, so this bound state can decay. Unlike the no global symmetry conjecture, we don't run into a similar problem with remnants. Um, even though there are infinite number of stable states, there's only a finite number of them within a finite mass range, so it's less clear why the weak variant conjecture should hold, given that it is a stronger statement. Now, as you'll hear from many, many other talks in this conference, several independent lines of arguments have given evidence for the weak variant conjecture, and I won't repeat the arguments here. I will refer you to their talk, but just to mention that when one uh, take into account additional features that come along with string theory. Now, these are very general arguments, but suppose you take into account additional features that come along with string theory, such as, mod such as module invariance. One seems to find evidence that the weak variety conjecture takes even stronger form, not just the existence of such a state, but, but perhaps an infinite number of them. So in this talk, I will focus on the mildest form of the weak variety conjecture, and I will show you some modest steps we have taken towards deriving it using unitarity and causality. So, the mild form of the weak variety conjecture requires only the existence of some state for an extremal black hole to decay to. So the natural question one can ask is, can an extremal black hole be such a state? The point is that the extremal condition Q equals to M is only a classical result. Any corrections, like higher derivative corrections, can modify the black hole solutions and the extremal conditions. So these effects are small. They are typically small because they are suppressed by the mass of the black holes. So for very large black holes, these corrections are unimportant, but not so when the black holes are not so large. And indeed, in the context of the heterotic string, these higher derivative corrections were shown to make some of the four-dimensional extremal black holes lighter than the classical bound. And so in our upcoming paper, we will show that this behavior follows from unitarity, at least in a wide class of theories that can be naturally realized in string theory. Okay. Now, to what extent does our proof apply? Well, if you already find a super extremal particle in the spectrum, then you are done. Uh, but even if not, what we find is that an extremal black hole can satisfy the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture in at least two classes of theories. The first class of theories are those with light, parity, even scalars, uh, or spin two particles in the spectrum. Now, light means that they are lighter than the scale, which I would call lambda QFT, where the ordinary descriptions of QFT would break down. So in string theory, you can imagine uh, these scalars could be the dilaton or any other moduli, which are stabilized at a mass below the string scale. While this seems to be a rather, uh, while this feature seems to be rather uh, natural in string theory setup, this is not the most general case. Um, nonetheless, it is general enough to subsume the class of theories to which the entropic proof of uh, Chang and R that you will hear more about tomorrow would apply. But you will see that unitarity would allow us to say a bit more. We know what kind of particles would be needed to satisfy this mild form of the weak variety conjecture. We need particles that are parity even. Uh, we know about the parity and as well as the spin. Moreover, you will see that the weak variety conditions that we derive is a strict inequality. Now, even if there's no, no such light particles in the spectrum, our proof will still applies to theories that emit three-level SUSY UV completion. By that, I mean that the higher derivative uh, four-point amplitudes are generated by three-level exchange, and they respect supersymmetry at the three-level. Okay. So let us start by enumerating the higher derivative, derivative operators to the simple Einstein-Maxwell theory. And we will assume that in the infrared, the dynamics of the black hole is described by an effective theory of photons and graviton. So in four dimension, the most general EF effective action, uh, up to four derivative operators are given as follows. And looks a little bit complicated with many terms, but you can use field redefinition to simplify it. 
And so using field redefinition, you can recast all these higher derivative terms into three separate terms that we call alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, where W that appears in this effective action is the wire tensor. All right, so this higher derivative corrections would modify the black hole solutions and the extremal conditions. And so the charge to mass ratio of an extremal black hole is no longer one, but one up to some corrections. Now, this formula that I listed over here is valid as long as the higher derivative corrections are small, which is the case when the black hole is large. When, when the mass of the black hole is large, when the charge of the black hole is large, this is a small correction to the extremal condition of a black hole. And this is the case when the black hole is sufficiently, uh, these high derivative corrections are negligible if the black hole is sufficiently heavy. And this is because uh, when you evaluate the Ricci scalar and the energy of the gauge kinetic function, your gauge, gauge, uh, gauge fields, you find that they all go like inverse with the mass of the black hole. So this is going to be a small corrections to the extremal conditions. So if you want to prove the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture, it just amounts to deriving this inequality for the Wilson coefficients. Alpha one and alpha three, these are two separate terms that appear in the higher derivative corrections. And as we'll show in our forthcoming paper, uh, this bound with a strict inequality follows from unitarity. Strict inequality means that uh, with the equal sign removed. So it would mean that the large black hole would prefer to decay to smaller. Um, so in supersymmetric cases, uh, there are, uh, so if alpha one is not zero, then it would be a strain inequality. I, I will come back to supersymmetric case later on. Okay, so now um, we could enumerate the possible sources of the higher dimension operators that would contribute to alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. And which, sort, which contributions dominate depends on your particle spectrum. Okay. So we would assume throughout our discussion that we have a weakly coupled UV completion. And there is some energy scale, lambda QFT, beyond which the ordinary QFT description breaks down. And in string theory, this is the string scale, above which we would have to take into account infinitely many local fields. Now, there are two possibilities. In addition to these heavy states that are above lambda QFT, there could be some light particles. Uh, there could be some massive particles that we call light particles because they are lighter than lambda QFT. All right, so uh, there are three sources of these higher dimension operators. And with our superb creativity with names, we will refer to, uh, to them as A, B, and Z. Okay. So uh, neutral particles can generate these high derivative operators at the tree level. Uh, a neutral boson would do it, and examples would include something like the diliton or moduli. Um, charged particles cannot contribute to these high derivative operators at the tree level, but they contribute at loops. The leading contribution is at one loop. There are also uh, contributions from UV physics, which are suppressed by lambda QFT. And we will discuss, in turn, the unitarity constraints on these various contributions. OK, so uh, first, the contributions from light neutral bosons. Uh, consider theories with a light scalar or pseudo scalar. Uh, integrating them out lead to these tree level couplings. Uh, these tree level couplings are suppressed by the mass of the particles. And if they are sufficiently light compared with the UV scale, they, their contributions dominate over the UV, physics, UV effects. Okay. Now, unitarity is what fixes the positivity of these Wilson coefficients. Um, more generally, unitarity implies that alpha one is positive when the photon is coupled to a parity even scalar or a spin two particle, whereas Unitarity would imply that alpha two is positive if the photon is coupled to a parity odd scalar field or a spin two particle. Notice that the spin two particles can carry uh, any parity in either case. That's an easy case. Now, uh, charged particles contributes to leading order at one loop, 
And you can consider, for example, a minimally coupled charged particle. Um, and the one-loop effective couplings generate, generated by a minimally coupled charged particle can be estimated in terms of the charge to mass ratio that I've been calling Z all along. And so alpha one, alpha two goes like all the Z to the fourth, whereas alpha three only go at most at all the Z square. So you see, if you find a particle with a large charge to mass ratio, then alpha three is subdominant. There is a hierarchy that is enjoyed by this Wilson coefficients. Uh, moreover, in this limit, gravity is negligible, and unitarity for quantum field theory uh, would imply that both alpha one and alpha two are positive definite. So this is the case that when you already have a super extremal particle in your spectrum, so not only can you satisfy the weak gravity conjecture with a super extremal particle, extremal black holes themselves can also satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. But we are interest, sorry, but we are interest, not necessarily in this case, we are also interested in the possibility that the, that the charge to mass ratio of the particles are not large, in which case the effective couplings are of order one. And in this limit, uh, no vigorous unitarity bound is known on this Wilson coefficients. But this is also the case where other effects that come in a tree level would dominate. This third type of effects comes from integrating out UV physics about lambda QFT, and they're suppressed by lambda QFT. And if you uh, addressing these questions in the context of string theory, uh, these are effects, these are the alpha prime effects in string theory. Now, in general, it's difficult to uh, fix the sign of this Wilson coefficients from unitarity. Um, there's no general statements one can make about the sign of all these alpha ones that are generated by integrating our string, stringy effects. Uh, however, if the higher derivative uh, operators uh, describing the four-point amplitudes are, ge are dominated, are, are generated by uh, some intermediate states, then we can say something concrete. So in a weakly coupled UV completion of gravity, this effect would be dominated by a tree-level exchange. In such a case, we could, uh, we could um, put a constraint on the Wilson coefficient alpha i's um, from unitarity, just as the tree-level effects from the neutral boson case. So summarizing the unitarity constraints for the various cases, uh, effects from neutral bosons, effects from charged particles, and the effects from UV physics, uh, we see that unitarity put a bound on some of the Wilson coefficients, not all. A power A doesn't look like we have enough to prove the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, one easy observation one can make is that when the loop effects dominate, then one can clearly say that um, the high derivative corrections to the extremal conditions of the black hole would make an extremal black hole lighter than the classical bound. This is the case when we already, when, it, when this effect dominates, this is the case when we already have a super extremal particle satisfying the weak gravity conjecture. So if we are interested in whether extremal black holes can play the role of the weak gravity state when no such super extremal particle exists, um, we are in the situations where the other effects dominate. When effect A coming from tree level boson exchange or from uh, UV physics dominate. Now, as I said, it may appear that we don't have enough to prove uh, the positivity of these corrections because unitarity only constrains two of the Wilson coefficients, but not the third. Um, as it turns out, the third Wilson coefficient is significantly constrained by other principles like causality and supersymmetry. So let's start with supersymmetry. So the point is that uh, the effective operators, one of these uh, higher derivative operators, would generate for us some new photon-photon graviton helicity amplitude um, that are not present in the Einstein-Maxwell uh, theory. Um, in particular, there are helicity amplitudes that are denoted by m plus 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 two, and this stands for the helicity. This stands for the scattering amplitude of two helicity plus photons and the helicity uh, plus graviton in the all incoming notation. Okay. So, this 
new helicity amplitudes are incompatible with the SUSI ward identities, essentially because the helicity symmetry is broken too much. So in supersymmetric theories, half of three is equal to zero. And so the weak gravity, the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture follows from unitarity, because we know that unitary theories have alpha one bigger than zero. Now, notice that I have only used supersymmetry of the three level amplitudes to set alpha three equal to zero. So our arguments is applicable even to non-supersymmetric theories, as long as the three level scattering of photons and gravitons is compatible with supersymmetry. So this is the case, for example, for the O16 cross O16 string, where supersymmetry, space-time supersymmetry is broken by an unconventional GSO projection, but the three-level vertices of the bosonic sector is the same as the superheterotic string. Now, there may be other principle that allows us to set alpha three equal to zero. For example, if you make a stronger condition of not demanding only the quartic interactions to be generated by three-level exchange, but also the cubic interactions are also generated by three-level uh, exchange of some massive particles, then alpha three equal to zero follows, as long as the photon and the graviton does, or the graviton does not kin kinetically mix with the heavy particles. Now, what if we don't have uh, three-level supersymmetry? Well, another point one can make is that the helicity amplitude that I have written down before also leads to causality violation at an energy scale of the order of M Planck divided by root alpha three. And so this scale must be above your lambda QFT. Moreover, it was argued in a situation like this, an infinite tower of massive higher spin states uh, is required to UV complete the theory. So whatever that UV completion is, we know that the, uh, this effect will be classified into what we call UV effects, effect C. So, in other words, causality implies that effect A, effect three level effects coming from neutral bosons, can never give a dominant contribution to alpha three. So, if the effect coming from neutral boson exchange dominate, causality would imply this relation, which means that the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture can be satisfied. And the requirement is for the low energy spectrum to contain a parity even scalar or spin to neutral particles with a mass smaller than the UV scale. So uh, we can summarize the coverage of our argument with this flow chart. Um, depending on the situations, we can prove the weak gravity conjecture using combinations of causality or uh, uh, three level supersymmetry. And you can see that if the dominant contributions to the four derivative operators come from a neutral boson exchange, we are in these situations where the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture follows from causality and unitarity. This is the case that was covered by the entropic argument uh, of Chang and all. But as you can see, our arguments can be applied to other situations as well when the loop effects or the UV, or the UV uh, effects dominate. There's also a nice interpretations of our findings in terms of open closed string duality, uh, which was pointed out to us by Kun Wun. Okay. So in string theory, charged particles are typically associated with open strings. So if you find a super extremal particle in your spectrum, then you're already done. If not, that means that the charge to mass ratio is small. And that also means that the corresponding open string must be long in order to make the charge to mass ratio small. And this is the regime where we should probably interpret the open string loop more appropriately in terms of closed string exchange. And so you can think of the extremal black holes that satisfy the weak gravity conjecture as the closed string channel version of the super extremal particles in the open string case. Okay, so what about stronger forms of the weak gravity conjecture? Since I have only one minute, let me just give you the punchline. So, um, so one might ask whether stronger versions of the weak gravity conjecture, such as the convex Hall conditions for theories with multiple U1s, or the tower weak gravity conjecture, or the soft lattice weak gravity conjecture, also follow from unitarity. Um, there we find that we can prove these stronger forms, but only if we make some additional assumptions on the UV. Uh, this is not surprising. If we do not a priori assume that gravity is negligible, 
uh, the unitarity bound would depend also on the uh, UV sensitive high derivative terms of gravity. This, however, does not mean that using the unitarity arguments to constrain weak gravity is an empty statement because with very mild assumptions on the UV, several strong conditions came out. Okay? In particular, one finds that unitarity, by considering the scattering amplitudes and demanding unitarity, uh, we find that when you consider scattering of particles, different photons, um, you not only get the convex Hall condition, but also the necessity of having a bifundamental field. This has implications for collusive climb reduction, because when you reduce your theory to lower dimensions, you get in addition to the original U1, a KK U1. And if you look at the spectrum, uh, for some value of the radius, the spectrum does not contain bifundamental field, which violates the positivity bound. And one way to save the day is to introduce a tower of states that, that are charged under the original U1. And so this led to what we call the tower weak gravity conjecture. And it's interesting to see how this condition come out through an, through an independent argument. So several stronger versions of the weak gravity conjecture uh, that require infinitely many charged states have been proposed on different grounds, either from moderate invariance of the well sheet theory or from other consistency requirements. But here, from unitarity, you also see the requirement of having an infinitely many, even infinitely many charged states. So to summarize, um, so we show that the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture can be satisfied by extremal black holes uh, for a wide class of theories, including those that have, can be naturally realized in string theory. For example, if you find in your low energy spectrum some dilettante-like field or moduli field, which couple to the photon, then they can play the role of sat satisfying the weak gravity conjecture. Now, I don't have time to tell you in detail about the argument on the tower weak gravity conjecture, but one finds that stronger versions of the weak gravity conjecture can also follow from unitarity if you make some additional assumptions on the UV. And what I find quite remarkable is not only that the various strong conjectures are related, uh, their proof are somewhat related as well, it will be interesting to find out what's the connection. So I will just stop there. Thank you for your attention. So I, w I noticed you didn't have the vial squared term. Is that because you're working strictly in d equals 4? Ah, so in, in the paper that would appear soon, we consider d equals to 5 as well. So that is the uh, w squared term, the y squared term. So, so in that case, um, you actually need spin 4 to complete vial squared at tree level, not, not spin 0 or spin 2. That's right. So, so but uh, in four dimensions, they won't matter. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, also, when, when you say that in d equals Four, you can just restrict to restrict spin zero or spin two. Uh, what about if I take a spin four and take the trace of it? So like take a thing with four indices, take a trace, and then couple it to something that has zero or two Lorentz indices. There, there, there are important differences, differences between doing that and just coupling a scalar that we, we should talk about offline. OK. To what extent this works at higher dimensions than five? Ah, so a higher dimension case is less clean, but uh, we did look at, uh, basically we look at extremal conditions for black holes again, and similar ideas using supersymmetry and causality could, con could basically prove this bound. Uh, so we would have to make some additional assumption about how the gauss bonnet term can be generated. Uh, so um, if we make some assumption about tree level completion, then, then there's a clean statement. If not, then we, we uh, we, we don't have uh, uh, as strong a result as for d equals to 4. Presumably, in this unitarity argument, you use uh, indirectly or directly a mass gap for the particles, right? Uh, so, depending on the situation, so. Um, because otherwise, probably you cannot use the unitarity argument. Right? So, so we are interested in situations like that where there's a there's a massive particles and they're not ma they, there's a gap. So, if that's what you meant, then you are forced to say that you have a mass gap. Either that, or you have some UV physics that dominate, or you already satisfy the weak gravity conjecture with a particle. So, in which case, we don't have to do this calculation. So 
So here, uh, when you when you took the higher order terms in your uh, Lagrangian, you you stopped at a point. So if you go even higher, you would get something like an alpha four, alpha five. Then what what difference would that make? So the assumption is uh, these are small corrections. So leading order is in fact is enough. So uh, the correction is the leading order that should be taken into account. Since it goes like one over Q square every time when you bring out a higher power, so it's irrelevant for the discussion. Thank you.